much for coming now. Yeah. Uh, thanks to everybody for joining us. Now we are going to have a lecture by our distinguished guest, Professor Travis Walkman, currently at the University talking on East Station, reading Korean proletarian literature. On East Station Marxism, I've just mentioned in our private conversation that I enjoyed reading his paper on so in sick and important and popular Marxist theoretician of the 1930s. And before that, he was also a Korean Communist Party figure, actually active in Tokyo in Korean Communist Party cycle uh, circles. So, and now Travis is currently working on East Asian film. And in this presentation, we are going to look into important continuities between late Japanese imperial filmmaking and early North Korean filmmaking. This element of continuity has been recently emphasized in South Korean research as well. I can cite here Han Sanon's research on such film figures as Moon Ye Bon and Kang Han Sik. And it's important that we also see how this question is being dealt with in the research outside of South Korea. So, uh, Professor Walkman, thank you very much for joining us. And floor is yours now. I think that we are pretty liberal with time. I mean, you need 50 minutes or one hour, I guess. Okay, thank you. Thank you so very much. Just uh, completely up to you. So I, I guess that up to one hour should be okay. But Okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, thank you very much for inviting me to speak here. And thank you to Professor Vladimir Tikhonov for the invitation and also to uh, Jong Gu Hyun uh, for inviting me and also the work of um, Go Jinu putting together the uh, invitation and the schedule. Um, I really appreciate this opportunity to discuss North Korean film and early North Korean film theory with you. Um, as we were talking about, uh, I had the time at 7 a.m. So I thought I had two hours of prep time <laughs> waking up uh, as early as I did. But so I apologize if um, I did not uh, reframe this paper um, to meet the interests of this uh, particular uh, research group. But um, I think that enough of uh, what I'm doing in relation to melodrama uh, and film melodrama between Japanese empire and uh, post-imperial uh, South Korea, North Korea will come across and we'll have uh, op opportunity perhaps to discuss um, the connections to Marxism and Marxist theory more broadly, which is somewhat perhaps underemphasized in this particular version of the paper. Um, I am going to share my screen if, do you, do I have the ability to do that? Uh, yes. yes. How does this work? Um, my apologies. I'm trying to figure figure out in PowerPoint how you uh, fill the screen. Well, um, is that view too cumbersome? <laughs> it doesn't look. 
Does, does anyone remember how to uh, go into uh, slide mode while also reading? Uh, slide show, play from start. That's right. That's right. Play for okay. start or play from current slides. That should work. Yes, that worked. Oh, um, but then, okay, here. Oh, uh, yeah. Yes. I'm trying to be able to also uh, read the paper <laughs> on the side. You know what I'm. What do you, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, certainly, certainly. You have the notes there below. Mm, present of you should work. Strange at that. Mm, yes, that that's okay, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. Um, okay. In any case, um, in order to read the paper, I'll have to leave it in this view. So I apologize for that. No problem. No problem. Uh, if anyone remembers how to fill the window, let me know. Okay. So anyway, apologies for that. So in my current research on the melodramatic mode in the South Korean and North Korean film industries, I am concerned with how the melodramatic mode allows for a synthesis of cinematic representation and political representation in a period of decolonization and Cold War conflict. However, many of the cinematic concepts, techniques, and affects of the Korean national cinemas of the liberation period, 1945 to 1950 for the purposes of this paper, first emerged during the late colonial period under the hegemony of the Korean Film Production Corporation and the Japanese imperial state. So my emphasis on melodrama, I'm interested in the relationship between affect, sentimentality, identification, and also mood, the mood of a melodramatic film in relation to political ideology, not just in terms of how melodrama expresses ideology or conveys ideology in, in the form of a kind of emotional interpolation per se, but rather uh, the mood of the film as a site of kind of uh, psychosocial conflict and uh, the way that various social contradictions inhere in a melodramatic film. And I think we see those tensions in North Korean film where the emotionality and the affect and the ideology are supposed to hang together in a fairly transparent way, but in actuality, particularly if we take into account these connections with late imperial filmmaking, we, we see rather um, many ways in which the, the melodramatic mode is, is kind of a mode of, of contradiction or at least counterpoint uh, containing um, various different um, directions of, of political ideology kind of simultaneously is my argument, but also references to historical experiences that um, can't really be fully cinematized or transformed into cinematic narrative. So the traces of history within uh, melodramatic uh, film that aren't necessarily present there on the sentimental surface of the narrative and visuality of the film. So those are some of the things I'm thinking about in relation to film melodrama um, specifically as a culture of you know, cinema more broadly in modernity, but also more specifically in relation to Marxism and in, and in particular uh, early North Korean um, cinematic representations of colonialism, social class, and and you know early social realist cinema in North Korea. So today I will focus on film and film theory in North Korea in the late 1940s and its continuities and differences with cinema under Japanese colonialism, despite the dominant national myth of North Korea as an anti-colonial partisan state that negated and superseded uh, Japanese empire. So this is really a comparative project. Uh, I'm looking at South Korean and North Korean film, but I'll focus mostly on the North Korean aspect for today. Uh, early North Korean film theory articulated concepts of cinematic mediation in the midst of political crisis and revolution between Japanese fascism Soviet occupation and its own globally marginal anti-colonial partisan movement. In engaging with the archive of North Korean film and film theory, I am interested in how post-colonial societies and cinema cultures during the early Cold War imagined new possibilities for national cinema. 
including differing ideas about how the process of national liberation should be narrated and aestheticized in Soviet occupied state socialist North Korea versus US occupied anti-communist South Korea. In particular, I am concerned with national cinema as a continuing uh, response to aesthetic crisis, an aesthetic crisis that is precipitated by cinema itself as an industrial technology. This is also part of my argument about melodrama is that in a way melodrama is also dealing with the aesthetic crisis that cinema itself introduces uh, to the body and the embodied experience of uh, industrial modernity. Discussions of the aesthetic crisis in mid 20th century Korea asserted that modern technology and media rendered sensory experience so fragmented and discontinuous that media and particularly cinema had to be transformed to serve as a unifying reorganization of mass aesthetic experience, particularly if the geo body of the post-colonial nation were to take any concrete form. So as many of you probably know, cinema was uh, the media, the medium uh, for cultural, mass cultural expression, you know, at the founding of North Korea in particular, but also in South Korea. So I'm interested in the, um, the sort of social purpose that uh, cinema was accorded uh, during this period of decolonization, particularly in relation to unifying subjectivity or bringing some kind of unity to what was, was, was seemingly a fragmentary and discontinuous and crisis-ridden experience of modernity. However, uh, I would also like to suggest that such aesthetic crisis produces repetition as much as it uh, forces innovation. For intellectuals and filmmakers who lived through and often participated in Japan's total mo mobilization system, it was impossible in a moment of crisis in the late 40s to simply discard one set of theoretical and practical reference points vis-a-vis -vis media and replace them with another. Reading 1945 not as a period marker in global or national history, but rather as a moment of crisis between the colonial and the post-colonial allows for the recognition of repetition uh, with difference in the aesthetic mediation of social and political relations. And this, I think, also has to do with how to read uh, the relationship between fascism and, and a post-45 socialist state like North Korea, um, but without relying on an idea of totalitarianism, without, without conflating them. So seeing what concepts from the Japanese empire and Japanese fascism were repeated in the North Korean context, um, but also, of course, uh, recognizing that it wasn't only continuity between fascism and North Korean um, socialism, if we use that term <laughs> for North Korea, which is somewhat controversial. But. So this is particularly relevant for a place like North Korea, which went from being occupied by a fascist imperialist power, Japan, to enacting a national and class revolution under Soviet occupation in a matter of weeks in late 1945. I read national liberation and national cinema under conditions of post Cold War post-coloniality as a matter of repetition rather than sublation, uh, taking up Jill Deleuze's critique of Hegel and his difference in repetition in order to argue that what we see in early film and film theory on both sides of the Cold War divide is not a negation, sublation, or supersession of colonial representations of Korean Japanese imperial subjectivity but often a repetition with difference of narrative, conceptual, and formal conventions. So Deleuze's critique of Hegel is kind of the theoretical background to this. Um, the main point is just that national liberation movements don't in Hegelian fashion uh, sublate the negativity of colonialism and, 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 and move uh, wholesale into a new period of history. Um, of course, uh, there's the problem of repetition and, and continuity between colonial and uh, post-colonial conditions. So to give a, you a sense of the broader scope of this issue beyond uh, North Korean uh, film theory, I will me just mention uh, three film careers that span 1945 in complex political ways, which um, Professor Tikhanov mentioned uh, two of these figures, Moon Ye-bong and uh, the director Chang Yu, who in a matter of two years went from making films supporting Japanese empire to making uh, liberation films in South Korea. 
Although his politics seem to have completely reversed, we see many repetitions between the two periods, particularly in the gendered uh, spatial configurations, classical Hollywood's double causal structure of narrative, a term from Bordwell, and uh, continuity editing of his films. Uh, double causal structure meaning um, combination of two narrative lines, heterosexual romance and public mission, which you see in a film uh, like Volunteer or uh, Korea Straight uh, from the late imperial uh, filmmaking in Japan, and as well in a liberation film such as uh, Chayu Manse or uh, Hurrah for Freedom. Uh, Kang Hongshik, who starred in many colonial period films, including a number of Japanese propaganda films before directing North Korea's first film, uh, My Home Village in 1949. Here we see a more radical shift from performing Japanese nationality toward developing socialist realist tenets for the context of Korean decolonization. But we also see repetitions in the film's aesthetics, uh, such as the use of deep space and the sublime as visual tropes of patriotism. So I'm interested in um, these uh, kind of formal aspects of cinema that can link up with different kinds of political ideologies. So deep space and the sublime and uh, point of view shots are used in My Home Village uh, the first North Korean film, um, and you know, not in the, exactly the same way, but similar uh, kinds of points of view shots and sublime landscape perspective were you also used again in, in a film like um, um, a Volunteer, for example, which wasn't directed by Kong, but has a similar style to Kong's um, the Homeless Angels, which he acted in and didn't direct. But so it's more of, uh, about these. Uh, stylistic continuities in cinema and their relationship to shifting political ideologies. Thirdly, uh, Moon Ye Bong, an actress who went from playing a volunteer laborer in the propaganda film Korea Strait to a few years later playing a woman who is conscripted for labor by the Japanese military, likely as a so-called comfort woman in uh, my home village. Although mobilization and labor as well as their pathos are continuities between the two characters, the volunteer, voluntary sacrifice of Kinshuku in Korea Strait is rearticulated as conscripted labor for Okdon in the post-colonial film, My Home Village. So with these two characters, you have a very clear example of, uh, you know, with five years difference, um, she went from playing a volunteer laborer to a conscripted laborer. Uh, and these, these kinds of um, shifts are really fascinating to me. So turning from uh, individual film careers to the conceptual register, one primary concern in tracing repetition and difference in the context of late 40s North Korea is the generally modern and avant-garde project of penetrating and transforming life through art and how this project became a specifically cinematic project in the mid 20th century, such that various political and ideological actors assigned to cinema the task of cultivating a new human subjectivity through cinematic spectacle. More specifically, if fascism can be defined in part as a counter-revolution represented as a revolution, uh, as well as a modernist avant-garde aesthetic project, how did socialist film theorists and filmmakers in North Korea deal with fascism and their own past experience of it? In order to take account of the conceptual dimension of the transition in Korean film history marked by the year 1945, uh, I'll turn to film theories put forward by originally leftist directors and critics who collaborated in quotation marks with the Japanese fascist state, um, its literary and cultural criticism and its film industry in colonial Korea in the early 40s and then went to North Korea during the Soviet occupation between 45 and 48, contributing their ideas and theories about film to the project of building the DPRK film industry. Uh, the repetition of theoretical concepts between these two contexts forces a rereading of the tension between the assumed aestheticization of politics under fascism and communism's politicization of aesthetics. Uh, Walter Benjamin's famous conclusion to his essay, The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproducibility, presents the aestheticization of politics and the politicization of aesthetics as the dialectical opposites in political conflict with one another. Although I can understand why he did this in the 30s, um, I think we maybe need to question this dichotomy, particularly in relation to North Korean film industry or other um, post-fascist 
uh, revolutionary regimes. However, in the case of North Korea, and perhaps more generally in moments of crisis, the tensions between fascist, communist, and capitalist film aesthetics are better considered a problem of the micropolitics of uh, film form, I argue, rather than a conflict between bounded ideological positions in dialectical tension with one another. So let me uh, then jump into the North Korean materials. Uh, so in this discussion, I will draw from the first three volumes of North Korea's uh, earliest film journal, Yonghwa uh, Yesu Film Art, which began to appear in 1949. Uh, most important uh, for this paper are the film theory articles of uh, theorists and practitioners such as So Kwang Jae, Yu Du Hong, and Chu Min, which appear toward the front of the volumes and stand out due to their complex critical writing style, their use of Japanese-based technical character compounds, and their inclusion of the intellectual vocabulary of the late Japanese empire. The style of these articles uh, reflects that all three of these intellectuals were educated in the Japanese uh, colonial education system, obviously, and uh, participated as filmmakers and cultural critics in supporting the Japanese imperial system, although to varying degrees. Uh, so Kwang Jae was a Kopf critic, um, before directing the now uh, rediscovered military train in 1938, a film that contains ambivalent messages about the need to be vigilant against liberation movement spies and the importance of Korea-Japan uh, unity. Uh, in 1943, Yoon Doo-hoon joined the Korean Alliance for National Total War and the Korean Patriotic Organization where he wrote on the importance of Koreans contributing to the Japanese war effort uh, Chu Min was not as prominent uh, in the Japanese empire um, as an intellectual, uh, but like So Kwang Jae and the actress Moon Ye Bong, after independence, he initially joined the leftist Korean Film Alliance in the South before going North to avoid anti-communist suppression and participate in the North Korean revolution. So, you know, these three film theorists have varying degrees of direct connection to the late imperial uh, fascist regime, um, also in their the way that they conceptualize North Korean um, film. <clears throat> okay, so I want to turn to uh, just a few main concepts of early North Korean film theory. Um, and, you know, these ideas were translated and repeated from the context of the Japanese empire. These were already active terms, some of which got taken up um, to articulate a concept of uh, Japanese imperial cinema. But of course, we also have to um, think about the influence of Soviet socialist realism um, and the way that terms were being translated and utilized um, from the uh, Soviet context. And so you find a kind of amalgam of different influences and translations going on uh, with this terminology in particular. So the first concept, uh, which was prevalent both in Soviet socialist realism and in some theories of Japanese imperial film is the idea of the total work of art or Gesamtkunstwerk, Sogo Geijutsu, Chong Hap Yesu, an immersive multi-sensory and multimedia artwork that brings together the various modern arts into a popular mass aesthetic experience. So, you know, with the use of music in North Korean film, um, the way that the uh, melodramatic aspect of the film is meant to kind of draw you into the diegesis and so word, world of the film in a very immersive and multi-sensory way, I think uh, reflects uh, this concern with the total work of art. So in what way could cinema be so immersive that it, in a way the spectacle could become the social experience without any outside to that aesthetic experience in a mass sense? Um, those kinds of ideas are associated uh, with this concept of the Gesamtkunstwerk, which of course also comes out of Wagner and opera. Um, and, you know, there's a connection here to the eventual use of opera and adaptation of opera in North Korean film. Uh, second uh, sort of conceptualization that we see uh, repeated uh, in the North Korean context is the assertion of Asian resistance against US empire and Western Europe and their debased capitalist cultural forms. 
So we see um, a, a kind of Pan-Asianism in early North Korean film theory. Um, and the centering of cinema as the primary medium for the subjectification or Juchehua and individualization, Kesonghua, of a national community. So already in 1949, you see the term Juche and cinema as the medium of Juche of, or subjectification. Um, and of course, we know that Juche is a, a term translated from the Japanese Shutai, and um, there are connections between um, Japanese colonial period, uh, various sort of articulations of practical subjectivity um, and uh, North Korean uh, political ideology in Juche Sasang. Um, and here uh, we see it articulated, particularly through cinema by uh, Yun Duhon in particular. The idea that uh, Number four, the idea that film could, should contribute to the revolutionary transformation of historical reality through the combination of fictional narrative and documentary realism. So this combination, combining realist realism of, of documentary filmmaking with fictional narrative, which we see in um, My Home Village, the first North Korean film. This was also very important for late imperial uh, Japanese film because um, in order to make a newsreel interesting enough for people to want to sit through two hours of a newsreel, uh, you have to combine it with melodrama, fictional narrative, something with individual characters. And that kind of hybrid film form was very um, prominent in the late Japanese empire as well. So let me turn to a few articles um, and just give you a sense of, uh, I don't know how many of you have you know, read these materials, um, but just to give you a sense of some of the arguments made in uh, film art in 1949. So uh, the term total work of art, to start there, appears multiple times to describe the ideal form of a film. Chu Min opens his essay, Ideas for Filmmaking for Aspiring Filmmakers with the following. Of course, the basis of film art is not solely montage, film art, that is a total work of art, takes all of the elements of literature, performance, art, music, and photography, and makes them work together in order to create a single work. So there you have the kind of multimedia aspect of cinema. Uh, constructing a film does not solely involve uh, montage or the editing together of shots and sequences, but should incorporate all the modern art forms into a single totalizing aesthetic experience. Um, Chu's opening statement echoes Eisenstein and other Soviet uh, theorists' ideas about sound film as a work, total work of art, which were translated into colonial Korea beginning in the late 20s, um, a connection that becomes clear in the third volume of film art, where Chu uh, explicitly quotes Eisenstein's discussion of the counterpoint between montage and sound. Um, however, um, again, there are also connections with Imamura Taihei and other theorists of, uh, of Japanese um, imperial filmmaking as well. So I'm interested in how this idea of the cinema as total work of art is taken up in different ways, both in colonial and post-colonial context. And to what degree the concept um, is the political position or, uh, or can the total work of art really have a, a different uh, post-colonial politics? The many uh, references to the total work of art um, situate the nascent North Korean film industry with the history of the modernist avant-garde, including if we follow Boris Groys's argument, the socialist realist system that was translated into North Korea through Soviet occupation. Uh, however, it also resonates with um, discussions of Japanese imperial uh, literature and film, uh, particularly if we situate them within the broader historical and political arguments of these early texts of North Korean film theory. For example, Chu goes on in the same essay to connect this concept to a critique of the lack of politicality and the lack of consciousness and ideology in the films of capitalist uh, societies. And the way he does so is actually reminiscent uh, somewhat of uh, the fascist uh, literary critic Che Jae So's Korean literature in a time of transition. Um, which launched similar criticisms of culture within what Che referred to as prophet societies. Uh, more important than Che's and Chu's location of the origins of cultural debasement in the capitalist commodity are their moralistic polemics 
against the cultural symptoms of this, dis deba this dis debasement. Uh, the cosmopolitan individuality, divided and fragmented subjectivity, and purely formal and psychological approach to representation in the experimental avant-garde art for art's sake and psychoanalysis. In the midst of the Pacific War, uh, Che associated all of these cultural symptoms of modernity or what he called the states of division, Bunretsu no Jotai in the subject with the detachment of cosmopolitan society from national community and proposed the formation of a multi-ethnic Japanese national literature as a solution to the alienation of the modern subject. Chu very similarly characterizes the experimental avant-garde art for art's sake and psychoanalysis as reflections of a degraded cosmopolitan culture but he more explicitly connects this bad cosmopolitanism to the project of American imperialism, stating that films that are without ideology or purposive consciousness, quote, become cheap tools of American imperialists who dream of a wicked world system that includes cosmopolitanism. Therefore, uh, Chu echoed Che's earlier fascist discussion of cosmopolitanism in claiming that the total work of art had an ethical mission to create a new ethics and a new human subjectivity not bound to the symptoms of cultural degradation and the artistic dishonesty of both formalist and commercial filmmakers. He was also, he was not only translating socialist realist ideas about the Soviet new man and socialist morality, because obviously he's also talking about the overcoming of alienation um, in a Marxist sense, uh, but also referring back to Japanese imperial theories um, which uh, in early 40s asserted the need to create an organic unity between artists, artworks, and the national masses, one that could resolve the aesthetic, aesthetic crisis of modern culture expressed in fragmented and pathological modern subjectivities and the separation of cosmopolitan culture from the national masses. So the critique of, although Chu is clearly working within a Marxist framework of critique of commodity, critique of alienation, He's also taking up the more moralistic um, late fascist, Japanese fascist discourse of overcoming fragmentation and um, pathological modern subjectivity through the assertion of a national film culture and, and a critique of cosmopolitanism as a kind of detached um, individuality not connected to the subjectivity of the, of the nation state. So um, yeah. Hopefully that's, it's clear how he's working in between Marxism and certain uh, fascist theories of subjectivity. If we consider Che J. Sol's late work in the early forties um, as fascist, which I would tend to describe uh, his literary theory as. Okay, so let's uh, move on to Yun Du Hon. Um, in my proposal concerning film art uh, from the same issue, former member of uh, the Total War or organization, Korean Alliance for National Total War, Yun Duhon connects the total work of art to the subjectification and individualization of the national people. Like Chu, Yun argues that film is an ideological tool and that it is responsible for creating a new ethics and a new human, particularly by enlivening the consciousness of national subjects, encouraging patriotism and building a new type of democracy. Furthermore, unlike literature, film has a mass appeal and scale and is therefore the most effective medium for ideological transformation. Ensuring this ideological role for cinema requires the development of new systems for film production, including systems of film theory and film production education, as well as the growth of film as an expressive system that can capture the truth of the historical moment. Uh, Yoon argues for learning from Soviet film and film theory in order to create these systems, but also for establishing a national individuality and national subjectivity that does not take the Soviet Union as North Korea's model or future form, but rather turns to the local historical conditions of Korea and really Asia, because uh, he also carries forward the Pan-Asianist discourse. Um, and drawing from ideas of the subject and aesthetics, um, Yun establishes uh, in such essays a number of precedents for future North Korean film and film theory. And I al already mentioned his use of the term ju hua so subjectification, uh, which of course <clears throat> in the 1960s became part of, uh, this term became part of ju che Sasang after Kim Il-sung's speech of 1955, where he invoked ju che um, So I think this article by Yun Duhon shows how how much Juche Sasang 
was connected to uh, late imperial discourse of subjectivity and not only um, the context of uh, Soviet occupation and assertion of national autonomy in relation to the Soviet Union. So that's one interesting thing uh, to trace is uh, in, in early North Korean film theory is obviously Juche wasn't something Kim Il-sung invented in 1955, uh, nor was it solely about North Korean relations with Soviet Union, but also um, of course these uh, theories of national subjectivity coming out of the Japanese empire. <clears throat> um, so Yoon states that American films have an anesthetic effect on the working class. So here, again, the Marxism comes in where film is a medium of, of um, anesthetizing uh, the masses. Film, uh, American films cause people to lose the ability to think in an idealistic way about the human and thereby enervate the consciousness of struggle within the working class. Um, so here the humanism is more of a Marxist humanism or early Marx at least in terms of overcoming alienation. He connects this loss of the capacity to idealize the human being or he connects it to the pollution of the human spirit under US occupation in Western Europe. So here, here again, it sort of begins with a commodity critique but then um, moves more into a spiritual argument. <clears throat> Not only is the US in France, so he's critiquing the Marshall Plan, taking the money and starving the population, they are polluting the human spirit of the population. This is the meaning of American entertainment. Just as uh, Chu argued that the European avant-garde was becoming further degraded culturally by the hegemony of US consumer culture, Yoon writes that uh, Korean filmmakers should no longer look to the, to the Western European avant-garde as directors in the South, such as Yu Hyun Mok would, but rather to create uh, to a creative and subjective translation of Soviet film and film theory. Um, but his earlier Pan-Asianism does come out in various moments in the essay. Uh, for example, when he refers to the developments made through the founding of the Korean film studio in Pyongyang as a source of pride for the East or Tongyang. So um, <clears throat> again, and the Pan-Asianist rhetoric is, you know, of course, Tongyang, a very uh, weighted term in the late Japanese empire with the work of Son Shik and, and other uh, Marxists who uh, turn to ideas of East Asian community. Here, the founding of the North Korean film in the film studio, or the film stu Korean film studio in Pyongyang is an example of a, a kind of Pan-Asianist um, pride. Um, so you can, I think, see the combination of various uh, political rhetorics um, being made in relation to uh, cinema and cinema kind of mediating these somewhat contradictory positions. There's the universality of the new human, and then it falls back on Pan-Asianism and a certain kind of Asian particularity in other instances. So um, we can see these kind of uh, contradictions and counterpoints. Okay, so turning to the last um, example of So Kwang Jae, of course, uh, he directed Military Train in 1938. Um, and in this, uh, in his work, we can see most concretely the kind of aesthetic and formal questions at play between Japanese imperial film and North Korean film and film theory. Uh, so argues that Sylvia films such as The Third Blow are humanist and heroic, but Hollywood films are not. He couches his discussion of heroism in many of the same assertions as the other two theorists, focusing in particular on a critique of the detached ahistorical an individualistic representation of the human being in psychoanalysis, something shared between the critique of psychoanalysis, something shared between um, this version of socialist realist film theory and um, a fascist uh, anti-cosmopolitanism. One of the most significant assertions in the essay is that in order to achieve a properly historical representation of the uh, human being, film as a total work of art will have to combine dramatic film with documentary film in order to create a new vision of history and historical transformation. What so appreciates about the artistic documentary of the third blow is that it quote, gets rid of the idea that future docu documentary films cannot also be dramatic, end quote. So of course we have the issue of propaganda here in terms of, I mean, obviously all films are propaganda, but a particular kind of uh, propaganda that attempts to 
um, situate historical actuality in cinematic spectacle by uh, combining um, a documentary film uh, with dramatic film. <clears throat> Rather than a film being guided by a single psychological individual, the protagonist of the film, he argues that, quote, events themselves uh, should become, this is a very interesting quotation, events themselves should become the protagonist of the film. Um, so here we see, I think, a, a, the possibility of a, of a Marxist cinema in this context um, where, you know, leaving by, behind the individuality of the main protagonist isn't just about a critique of cosmopolitanism or individual psychology, and it's not so moralistic. The point of doing that is to sort of capture his, historical events as mass events um, and to articulate um, some kind of political relation to historical events um, by setting aside um, this concern with individual protagonists. So his, his theory uh, starts with the critique of the commodity but tends not to veer so easily into this pan-Asianist or post-fascist rhetoric, I would say, among the three um, theorists. Um, and we can see an example of what So is saying uh, in my home village. Um, so in my home village, which I don't know how many of you have seen uh, this first North Korean film from 1949, but in the film, the brother son protagonist Kwan Peel experiences prison um, and his and is uh, becomes an effective partisan, and that's the first half of the film focusing on the protagonist Kwan Peel. Uh, but the second half kind of cross cuts between circumstances in Kwan Pil's home village and the return and uh, of course the, the uh, victory of the North Korean revolution in, on August 15, 1945, which is attributed to Kim Il-sung. And then um, also the return of Kim Il-sung to Korea. And so the film gradually sort of shifts away from Kwan Pil as a protagonist to the event of the North Korean revolution which includes splicing of stock footage from the North Korean revolution. So combination of documentary with a melodramatic fiction film. Um, but then, you know, in the middle of that, the, the kind of montage sequence at the climax of the film, um, we also have the return of uh, Kim Il-sung and um, an aesthetics of what Stephanie Donald calls the socialist realist gaze. So fictional characters, um, I, we have a little bit of time, <laughs> so I'll uh, try to stream this so that you can um, see how the uh, the event itself becomes the protagonist. So uh, those last shots are an example of what Donald called the socialist realist gaze. So, uh, you know, you have a lot of images of people looking toward the future and the revolution is represented as a mass aesthetic experience too. Uh, but at, in this scene, at least, Kim Il-sung becomes the ocular center of the scene and the gaze toward the future becomes the gaze toward the leader. Uh, and so, <clears throat> and you can see that tension in a lot of North Korean films, 
even though Kim Il Sung himself becomes less and less visible in the films, you know, is the um, is is uh, re is the ongoing revolution a, a mass experience of liberation, or is it uh, is the aesthetic center of this um, historical event Kim Il Sung as kind of the ultimate protagonist of history, which uh, Donald argues in relation to um, Stalin in uh, late in Stalin era socialist realism in the Soviet Union. Um, so I think, um, interestingly though, uh, So Kwang Jae um, argues uh, that the events should be the protagonist of the film without saying much about Kim Il-sung. And in the essay, you get this sense that he's trying to avoid invoking Kim Il-sung. Uh, and he does put Kim Il-sung's name in the essay once, but he's really trying to maintain an idea of a revolutionary cinema that would combine fictional narrative like Fon Peel's narrative, which is really engaging because you see his imprisonment, his oppression and his becoming a partisan. And then at the end, you see the family and the, and the kind of redeemed landscape through those point of view shots of the Korean landscape. And so there is a really powerful and effective um, narrative of individual and collective liberation in the film. Uh, and uh, so it wants to combine that with this kind of documentary realism, um, but without, I think, stay, stating it explicitly, I don't think that he is very interested in, in uh, the kind of cult of personality aspect of a film like My Home Village, which honestly is pretty brief in the film. Most of it is about um, the revolution and the experience of uh, national liberation and class liberation. Um, so in any case, I hope I've conveyed the way, the complexity of early North Korean film theory, connections with Marxism and the critique of the commodity, but also echoes of moralistic fascist uh, critiques of fragmentation and cosmopolitanism. And then in, in someone like So Kwang Jae trying to maintain a kind of consistent idea of a potential revolutionary um, film aesthetic without falling into a kind of cult of personality um, and, and his implicit critique of the idea that a film should even have a, a single protagonist, uh, whether leader or individual um, protagonist in the, as in the case of Hollywood film. Um, so that's, that's all I have. And uh, again, I apologize. Um, I was scattered at all because uh, of <laughs> not having my two hours of preparation, but uh, I guess we'll open it up to questions then. I also apologize for the um, state of the PowerPoint there. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. And it is, we organizers, we have to apologize. It obviously was supposed to be two hours later in a bit more godly hour, but there was some uh, ob obviously some sort of mistake in the process. So that's no why- problem, it, No problem, uh, no problem. So, so the we who, are, who have to apologize and we full heartedly apologize for that. So thank you very much for extremely interesting presentation. I was listening with great interest, partly because some of the figures whom you mentioned are also the people on whom I've been researching, like So Guanjie, who actually, he was the guy who introduced Eisenstein's particular montage technique into Korea and that all happened in the late 1920s. So he had a long career in this sort of international progressive cinema before being pushed into working for Japanese fascism. And then as you have just narrated, he went north and tried in the beginning in a way to build up cinema, which would be at least a bit less contaminated by personality cult, which obviously in the end, he disappeared somewhere. He doesn't seem to appear in the publications after mid 1950s. So, mm. so and then another person whom I sort of fascinated with Chumin, since among all the cinema people in the cup, he was perhaps the one who, who 
who, who didn't collaborate with the Japanese, a rare example of somebody who didn't collaborate that much with the Japanese colonizers. So obviously it's extremely interesting people, very interesting time. And the most fascinating things here are of course, all those deep interconnections between, for example, far right and far left capitalism critiques in, in um, in, in modern times, so there, there are obviously interconnections also, of course, we have to remember that those critiques are powered by a very different worldview, by exactly, completely opposite worldviews. But if you look into the critique as text per se, there are certain interesting interconnections, there are deep, deep interconnections. It was also interesting to listen, uh, interesting to encounter words like cosmopolitanism. Cosmopolitanism was a bogeyman for criticism in that time in Soviet Union. It was obviously, this criticism was also a sign that Soviet Union was moving into much more nationalistic direction after the end of the war. And perhaps the enthusiastic reception of this critique of fruitless cosmopolitans in North Korea also signified shared passion for nation building. So th that's a very interesting point which you have mentioned. So thank you very much once again, and now the floor is open for debates and I'm waiting for questions. You can either indicate um, that you have a question by using, we have a sign in, in Zoom, you have this uh, raised hand sign so you can, push uh, push it so uh, you can use this sign or otherwise you can write your question in chat and if you don't wish to voice it yourself then I can voice it for you so I can I, I can recite it for you so waiting for questions suggestions remarks I'm trying to look for any raise hands icons here. So far, don't see any. And so do we have any questions? Anybody so, who would like to ask for maybe clarifications or additional information? Just a minute, I don't see any raised hands so far. So, okay, if we, don't have that many questions, uh, that many questions right now. Maybe then I, I, I could ask a question myself. <laughs> so I have many, I have many, but just not to monopolize the time would like to uh, ask, ask only, uh, only one. And the, uh, the question is, um, is about, uh, you, you have been just mentioning, you mentioned Deluge and his ideas that you used in order to unpack those interconnections between colonial and post-colonial aesthetic phenomena. I, I just wonder whether one can also avoid necessarily involving French post-structuralism, <laughs> whether it might be possible also to connect those phenomena by, for example, pointing out to the both colonialist imperialism and post-colonial statehood after all both belong to shared field of modernity. So to say and there are certain shared modern notions, shared modern, inst modern institutions, and systems that postmodern statehood obviously comes to continue even after the colonial statehood is being either destroyed or taken over and largely inherited. That's what happened in South Korea very obviously. So maybe it's something that has to do with this shared modernism of both systems, so maybe we, we even don't need Deluge here. <laughs> so <laughs> so the, uh, uh, this, is a, this is a question. So if, if you would like to elaborate on this point. Yeah, I, th I think you're right. Um, I actually forgot that that was still in the paper because it's a little bit of a hangover from <laughs> reading difference and repetition. But um, I think that in terms of yeah, what, what, what are the issues at stake here? I think uh, 
modernity um, and the, the shared institutions of modernity is probably a clearer way to think about um, the relation uh, between the colonial and the post-colonial. I guess the one part of Deleuze's argument that's helpful to me is that he's um, discussing temporality in a different manner. So uh -huh. temporality, not in terms of history as in Hegel or historical transformation, um, but temporality as a repetition. Um, so of course, temporality is very much wrapped up in the problem of modernity um, and, and uh, but uh, I would agree that we don't need to always refer back to French post-structuralism for sure. <laughs> um, I guess what I'm trying to capture and there's different language to capture this relation between the post-colonial and the colonial. Another one that I find useful is Feng Chea's discussion of the mutual haunting of the people and the state in, in the post-colonial context. So there, um, the state isn't the overcoming of colonialism, but it's in a relation of haunting with the people who are supposedly liberated through um, the anti-colonial movement. Um, so that's another articulation of and, I, and both are, are temp ways of rethinking the temporality of anti-colonial revolution or post-coloniality. And I think that that's all I'm trying to get at is um, how to, because even with the way that 1945 becomes this marker in modern history mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and gets plotted in the modern chronological timeline is it itself problematic and of course, would tend to mask these various relations of whatever you want to call them, <laughs> repetitions, hauntings, um, connections with the past. Mm. So, um, but in, in general, I, I would agree with you, uh, particularly for a more sociological analysis, like looking at, well, all of this, these are just various forms of state building, um, which is general to moder modernity across state socialism and capitalist societies. That would be another useful way to think about it, I think. Yeah. Thank you very much. And I guess we more or less share here the same, same approach. So I'm also a bit more a fan of sociological rather than philosophical. <laughs> right. Yeah, Deleuze, I, mean, I don't think Deleuze's reading of Nietzsche is particularly useful, actually, for what we're trying to understand. So, <laughs> I, so I, I my, think the point. <laughs> uh, so, and if I am allowed to continue on this and then returning to philosophy uh, and uh, after me, then we are going to have Komenjis and Sanima and her question. So uh, returning to philosophy, you just mentioned the cult of personality, the Nask and cult of Kim Il-sung's personality. And of course, I think it was probably Stalin's picture in one of his slides of the, from the film. So I was was looking pretty similar. Oh, oh, I, 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 that that's a still from the third blow. So, right, yeah. right, right. So, that's so, so ob obviously one of many prototypes of uh, what the North Korea built with General Kim Il Sung. So, and thinking about personality cult, how do you think maybe use, for example, some references to Hegelian philosophy in order to explain? personality cult and its persistence in many post-colonial situations, but also in all those attempts like Soviet one to build alternative world systems, alternative modern world systems. So obviously you remember how Hegel viewed Napoleon as the person who at some point embodied history. And then late Hegel, of course, differed a lot with from that and late Hegel you have the Prussian status collective embodiment of history's progress but this idea is that one personality may serve as embodiment of history embodiment of some code of special temporality at some point in this whole setting of personality cult isn't something Hegelian is that? <laughs> it's something that I'm trying to wrestle with 
because obviously oh, whether, personality whether or not it's a given. Mm -hmm. yeah because personality cult issue is something that you encounter as soon as you start working on any real-time socialist movements in 20th century and i do work on them so mm -hmm. so that's something that you have to struggle with <laughs> so i i wonder if you find any connections with this hegelian idea of modernity and embodiment so embodiment of historical temporality here yeah i think i mean i hadn't traced it in hegel's work um the way that you have but that sounds like a problem in uh, i guess i turned to theodore adorno in uh, minima moralia from 1944 where he says that uh, now, uh, uh, you know, Hegel thought of Napoleon as world spirit on horseback, but now mm -hmm. the world spirit has no head and is a missile. <laughs> so there's a way where all of that human agency that's supposed to congeal in, in the personality of the state is actually now just an anonymous technological means of destruction. Um, so I think I'm also interested in that Hegel's optimism about the human's capacity to control its own conditions, political conditions, in that very intentional and willful way, which I think Adorno in 1944 pointed out how the technology has now superseded the human's ability to really um, you utilize it in a conscious, fully conscious manner. So I guess that's one reference I think of, but in terms of tracing the, the problem of the state in Hegel, I don't maybe know the, his, all of his works uh, in detail enough, but your argument sounds convincing that at least there's the issue of the cult of personality from the, from the outset. Um, Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your answers. And now it's turn of Cominges and Senyu. So please, you can either write your question in chat or just voice it yourself. So you have to unmute yourself or should I try to unmute you? Yes, I think you're unmuted now. So please, you can voice it yourself. Hmm? Um, thank you for your interesting talk. And uh, I have a question about one thing. Because at the beginning of your talk, I heard the melodrama is your better. So I would like to listen your explain about the uh, more explain about the melodrama in that days in North Korea. Because um, you show us for a film, which is more, I think it, the director of So uh, the the film. Oh, uh, uh, sorry, that was directed by Kang Hong Shi. Uh, um, I was more connecting his I So Kwang Jae's ideas to Kang Hong Shik's film, but yes, please. Um, I would like to know how the melodrama in Korea decolonized from Japanese imperialism can be di directed as an avant-garde film art. I can imagine the a documentary film which contained the ideology, and I think it is a good A instrument. From the development for the deliver the ideology or propaganda, uh, I thought the film which you show us it looks like a documentary film. Uh, is it is it right or is it a melodrama? Uh, it's um, a documentary sequence inserted uh -huh. into an anti-colonial melodrama focused on mostly one family and one village. So uh, unfortunately, I couldn't show more scenes, but and so maybe my point was a little lost, but that sequence appears in the middle of what is more of a family-centered melodramatic film about uh, partisanship. Uh, I think the documentary film is a good instrument for the de deliver the ideology, because it it is um, clarified but I think melodrama is really complicated, which um, when people um, see the drama and they, they should um, analyze the uh, things of uh, the story of that film, 
So um, I think it is really hard thing. Uh, I cannot ima imagine how the melodrama can be a good instrument for the de uh, for delivering the idea of propaganda or ideology. I would like to know how to think about this. Yeah, thank you. That's that's a really key question. Um, I think mel melodrama, I would agree, is is very unstable because of the affect, right? There's no easy way to create a, a direct ideological link between the affect and the idea, uh, which uh, Kim Jong-il in On the Art of the Cinema tries to do this. Um, you know, how do you employ emotion, affect, sentimentality while constantly directing it back to the ideological seed of the film? Um, and I would agree that while documentary, that relationship to history or politics is clearer at least, um, it might not always have the same affective appeal or capturing the audience's attention and interest, or it might not be as uh, somatically immersive as a melodrama, but it's precisely that embodied dimension of melodrama that makes it unstable as a tool for propaganda. So this is why I find melodrama fascinating in the Cold War Korea, both in South Korea and North Korea, because you see these tensions between affect and mood. And sometimes the mood of the film is kind of mediating between affect and ideology. Um, but the, the idea, the political idea behind the film um, <clears throat> is often, there's, uh, there's always affect in excess of that message, you know, political message, um, which allows the film to melodrama to reference historical experiences that are buried, um, negative, what uh, Berlant calls social negativity. So not every North Korean viewer necessarily had a positive <clears throat> experience of the North Korean revolution itself, right? <laughs> um, so part of that negative relationship to the social totality is, is captured in melodrama through the, the pathos and the negative mood. And, and then there's an attempt to recode that into ideology, but it's always incomplete, I would argue. Um, so I think I would agree that um, whereas documentary can make that link clear to a fault because then what's, there isn't always the interest, the affective interest. Um, melodrama is a very unstable form to take for a political regime to take up, I would say. I don't. Uh -huh. okay. <laughs> Thank you very much for your answer. And then I wonder if we have any more questions on this fascinating topic of uh, how Korean cinema, North Korean cinema came into being on the crossroads of the imperial legacy, Soviet and Eastern European influences. Ah, here we have a question. What is the difference between a decolonized film and Soviet socialism realism film? I think it's similar in terms of idolizing. Is there anything special about decolonization? It's a question. Uh, yeah, that's an excellent question. Thank you, yeah. Um, clearly from the beginning, North Korean state was more concerned about decolonization than about uh, I guess, um, well, okay. <laughs> I think, uh, well, the, 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 interestingly, the socialist realist films that North Korean film theorists were referencing like Third Blow are World War II films, right? So mm -hmm. Third Blow glorifies Stalin's uh, acumen and military strategy during mm -hmm. World War II. So uh, insofar as that's, not exactly a film about decolonization, but um, <laughs> it's interesting how repelling the German invasion in a film like Third Blow, you can kind of translate that into a, a, a film aesthetic that's concerned 
more with um, decolonization. But I think the specificity of decolonization in a film like My Home Village is the focus on the Manchurian partisan movement. So these are the kind of specificities of the North Korean revolution, right? The centering of the rural partisan and the rural village as the center of uh, the formation of revolutionary consciousness. Um, and, and of course, uh, the addressing the issue of the large landowning class in Korea and their cooperation with Japanese imperialism and the Gwangju army and so forth. Um, these, there are, there are a lot of, there's a lot of content in all North Korean films, but in Ne Ko Young is as well at the very beginning that are very specific to decolonization in North Korea. And um, I think that we would have to contrast that to socialist realism, even if interestingly, like for example, with the cult of personality, the military acumen of Stalin can, you know, in the context of World War II, um, can be highlighted through many of the same stylistic features as a film like My Home Village shows the leader in the decolonization movement. So uh, again, there's translation, but also very much uh, historical specificity. Um, and of, of course, in the height of Juche realism, uh, Juche Sashiojui in the late 60s, decolonization, Soviet socialist realism is completely bracketed and ignored um, gradually. Uh, it, when My Home Village was made, there was still this relationship with Soviet socialist realism. Um, but in films like Flower Girl or Sea of Blood, um, there's a return to the Japanese colonial period um, as in My Home Village, um, but as uh, the origin of the North Korean state. Um, so the emphasis of the, what Wada Haruki calls the partisan state or the guerrilla state of North Korea um, and, and the process of decolonization is emphasized more and more, I would say, um, through the history of North Korean film. Um, whereas in my home village, you do see these connections to Soviet montage still um, and, and some connections um, to Soviet socialist realism that seem more directly uh, translated. I don't know if that answers your question. Oh, similar in terms of the cult of personality. Um, one kind of cinematic quality that is very specific perhaps to decolonization is the use of point of view shots and landscape. So this kind of romantic, this rural romantic nationalism in my home village where it's really about regaining the land um, from colonization. That is actually the main theme of the film. So this emphasis on the partisans relationship to the land is perhaps a bit specific to decolonization in the film. Well, I, I would suggest that decolonization films are still being made in both Koreas, actually in South Korea prominently films like Amsal, Milchono, those recent films dealing with uh, heroic resistance during the colonial days, mostly by anarchists because making communists into positive protagonists is perhaps still quite dangerous in South mm. Korea. So I would suggest that decolonization films are still in making because after all, South Korea never fully decolonized. So, so obviously it remains a task and it is being sought about as a task, I think. So mm. Strong consciousness that it's something that has to be done. So I wonder if we have any other questions. Here I see no raised hands so far and it looks like we don't have anything in chat. So since the questions are seemingly all asked, I would like to thank you, Travis, once again for, join, uh, for agreeing to deliver this lecture at us. Thank you very much. And once again, sorry for this uh, mistake this time. Oh, oh no problem at all. Really <laughs> thank you so much for the invitation. And it was really great speaking oh. to you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Travis. And thank you. Uh,
all those who joined us, thank you very much for listening. So now I guess we are more or less done. And next time I think I will appear in the same role on June 1st, we are going to host lecture by Professor Hiro, uh, Hiroaki Matsusaka, who is joining us now as well in Zoom. So thank you very much and see you again on June 1st. I hope that you continue following our lecture series. Thank you. Bye-bye.